allogeneic stem cell transplant for patients, family, and caregivers. An allogeneic stem cell transplant is a medical treatment that replaces a patient's bone marrow with new healthy cells from a related or unrelated donor. Before patients start their treatment, there is certain information that is important to know and will help patients, family, and caregivers prepare. In this video, we will discuss what a stem cell is, go over a generalized timeline for an allogeneic stem cell transplant at Moffitt Cancer Center, and provide details on how and what to expect. So what happens with an allogeneic stem cell transplant? First, bone marrow and cancer cells are destroyed with high dose chemotherapy or what is often referred to as conditioning therapy or treatment. The patient then receives a stem cell transplant after conditioning therapy is complete. We then wait for these new cells to begin to grow or what we call engraft and create new bone marrow in approximately or on average in 15 to 21 days. This is a brief summary of the process, and now let's go into the details. What is a stem cell? A stem cell is an immature blood cell that can develop into one of the three types of blood cells we have in our body. Those cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. After the transplant is complete, we wait for the new cells to grow and focus specifically on a type of white blood cell called a neutrophil. Neutrophils are the first type of white blood cell to respond to infection and help protect the body against infection. This is a generalized timeline of an allogeneic stem cell transplant. During the initial visit, the patient will meet with their primary blood and marrow transplant doctor and team often referred to as BMT team for short. After the initial visit, the blood and marrow transplant team will develop a treatment plan, which includes conditioning chemotherapy, timing for transplant, and vital organ testing. Vital organ testing can be done in different departments and different locations at the cancer center. The purpose of this testing is to make sure the patient's body is ready for transplant. After this testing is complete and the patient is deemed ready to move forward with transplant, they will have an appointment with their BMT doctor to review the test results and sign consents. Next, a central line will be placed, which will be discussed in more detail shortly. The steps discussed thus far are completed in the outpatient setting, meaning the patient will come in for the appointments and go home after. The next step is the start of conditioning therapy. This is when the patient is often admitted to the hospital. During this time, the donor stem cells are being collected. We have a numbering system that we use in transplant and the day of admission begins on a day minus number. The number itself depends on the conditioning therapy regimen the medical team has ordered. For example, a patient may be admitted on day minus six, and then we count up and finish our negative numbers prior to the transplant day, which is called day zero. The day after transplant is day plus one, and we continue to count up each day after. Once the stem cell infusion is complete, we wait for cells to begin to grow or what we call engraft and create new bone marrow. Allogeneic transplant patients on average engraft anywhere from day plus 15 through day plus 21, at which time the patient may be able to leave the hospital and stay locally until day plus 90. This is a lot of information, so let's break it down in a little bit more detail. As mentioned, after the initial visit and when vital organ testing is complete, 
the patient will have a central line placed. A central line is a hollow plastic tube that is placed in the chest and tunneled under the skin. It is used for infusion of stem cells, chemotherapy, administration, drawing blood samples, and administration of IV fluids, medications, and any transfusions as needed. The procedure to place a central line is done in the outpatient radiology department and takes approximately 45 minutes. Because this is considered a surgical procedure, patients will receive further instructions regarding preparation. In most cases, patients will receive light sedation, so they will need someone to drive them home after the appointment. Ice packs will help with comfort and swelling, and the medical team can let the patient know if medications can be taken for pain if needed. The line will be placed in the patient's chest on the opposite side of the chest if the patient currently has a port. This line can have either two or three external tubes or what we refer to as lumens. The nurses in the BMT treatment center will care for the line by flushing it and changing the dressing while the patient is outpatient. This dressing will be changed every seven days and or as needed. The dressing and line will have to be covered when showering to protect it from getting wet. And the nurses will show the patient how to do this prior to going home. The line will stay in place throughout the transplant and the doctor will determine when it can be removed. These central lines are often removed before the patient returns home. The patient's next appointment is often admission to the hospital where they will begin conditioning therapy. Each patient will have a treatment plan that is determined by their primary BMT doctor. The chemotherapy or conditioning therapy will be given over one to six days, depending on the plan. Scheduled nausea medications are given prior to the start of chemotherapy and additional medications are available as needed. One of the chemotherapy drugs that may be used in conditioning is called melphalan. The nurses have orders to bring patients ice chips to keep their mouth cold if the patient receives this drug. Patients will be asked to hold the ice chips in their mouth and allow them to melt for five minutes before the start of the melphalan infusion, during the infusion, and for 15 minutes after the end of the infusion. The reason for doing this is that it is shown to decrease the severity of mouth sores, a potential side effect of chemotherapy. After the days of chemotherapy are complete, the patient will have what's called a rest day on day minus one, where no chemotherapy is administered. Once conditioning therapy or chemotherapy is completed, it is time for transplant day, which is completed on day zero. The stem cell transplant will be completed in the patient's room. Pre-medications such as Tylenol or Benadryl are often given to prevent any reactions. Patients may also receive IV fluids before and or after the transplant. The length of time it takes to complete the transplant depends on the number and size of bags the patient will receive, which is determined by cell count and processing. The nurse will take multiple sets of vital signs during and after the infusion and monitor for any side effects. Patients should report any new symptoms to the nurse right away. After transplant day zero, we start to count up day plus one, day plus two, and so on. This is when we are waiting for engraftment for those new cells to begin to grow. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelet counts will begin to drop after conditioning therapy is completed, which is expected. These counts will then begin to rise once the new blood cells start to grow following transplant. This is called engraftment. The first cells to usually return are white blood cells, then red blood cells, and finally platelets 
However, each patient can differ. As we wait for engraftment, patients may experience the side effects of conditioning therapy and any complication of transplantation. Common side effects of conditioning therapy include nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, decreased appetite, mouth sores, hair loss, pain, fatigue, changes in memory and concentration, decreased blood cell counts, and possibly infection. Patients may experience one of these, several of these, or all of these side effects. It is important that patients communicate to their nurse and medical staff about their symptoms when they occur so we can help with symptom management. Nausea and vomiting can start at the beginning of chemotherapy. There are different therapies and medications available to treat this. If patients experience diarrhea, the medical staff needs to know. If it is liquid, watery stool, we will need to obtain a sample and send it to our lab to test for infection. There are also medications to help manage this side effect. Patients can often experience decreased appetite due to nausea and vomiting and or taste changes. There is a dietitian available to assist with any nutritional needs. It is important to get enough nutrition and stay hydrated during this time to keep the body strong. We will monitor everything patients eat and drink to make sure the body is getting what it needs. We may need to give patients IV fluids to prevent dehydration. Mucositis is a medical term for mouth sores. Patients may get sores in their mouth, on their tongue, and or lips. Sometimes the throat can have sores and make it difficult to swallow. We have mouth washes and rinses to use for comfort, and some patients may need pain medication to help until it heals. If the pain becomes too severe, medications are available to help manage the pain. Hair loss can usually occur around day plus 10 or 11. The nurses can help make arrangements at our salon for patients to have their head shaved if they would like. Fatigue is one of the most common side effects and can often take a while to recover from. The best thing patients can do is to stay as active as possible. Taking walks, staying out of bed, working with physical therapy as scheduled will help this. Patients' blood cell counts will decrease as a result of conditioning therapy, which is expected to happen, but will put the patients at risk for infection and potential bleeding risks. Nurses will write up the cell counts on a calendar in the patient room every day so patients, family, and caregivers are aware of where these counts are at. As mentioned, pain can be a potential side effect experienced during this treatment from possible mucositis, abdominal pain, body aches, bone pain, or potentially chronic pain. It is okay for patients to use pain medication to control pain. The medical team will manage these medications to make sure patients are not becoming addicted and doses can be adjusted to reduce possible side effects associated with medication. Our goal is to keep your pain at a comfortable level. So it is important that patients communicate to the medical staff when they are experiencing pain. Decreased blood cell counts are an expected side of conditioning therapy. These counts, as mentioned, will be written on a large calendar in the patient room every day. The counts that will be written on the calendar are the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and platelets. With the white blood cells, as mentioned, we are focused mainly on the neutrophils, which is a type of white blood cell that can respond to infection. When patients' absolute neutrophil count, or ANC for short, drops below 500, patients are considered neutropenic and at high risk of infection. Red blood cells are what carry oxygen to the body and are measured in hemoglobin. If the patient's hemoglobin drops below seven, the patient will require a blood transfusion unless specified by the medical team. 
Some patients may require blood transfusions prior to dropping below seven. Platelets help to prevent bleeding by helping the blood clot. Bleeding risk increases when the platelet count drops below 50. It is important that patients report any signs of bleeding, for example, a bloody nose or gum bleeding. When the platelet count drops below 10, patients will need to receive a platelet transfusion. When the blood cell counts, or more specifically, the white blood cell counts begin to drop, patients are at risk for infection. Infection can occur anywhere in the body. Patients will receive medication to help prevent infection and often treat infection, such as bacterial, viral, and or fungal infections. While in the hospital, nurses and oncology technicians will be checking the patient's temperature every four hours. If a patient has a temperature of 100.4 or higher, the nurse will start what is referred to as fever protocol. Fever protocol is a term we use to describe a list of things the medical staff will do if or when a patient has their first fever. This includes drawing blood cultures from the patient's central line or port, or possibly an IV stick. A chest x-ray will be done, and the patient will be asked to provide a urine and stool sample to look for the possible source of infection. Sometimes there's a specific source of infection. However, there are many different things that can cause fevers. We will treat the patient as if there's a possible infection regardless while their new immune system is still growing. Due to low counts and as mentioned already, patients will be at high risk of infection and possibly at risk for bleeding. Both infection prevention and bleeding prevention start the day of admission. Hand washing is expected of everyone. Everyone entering the blood and marrow transplant department is required to wash their hands either with soap and water or hand sanitizer. No one that is feeling sick or has been exposed to anyone with contagious disease should visit. No fresh or dried flowers and or live plants are allowed. We ask that patients remove any gel, artificial nails, and or piercings with the exception of earrings. If patients use contact lenses, they should bring their glasses and not use these lenses during this time. To prevent bleeding, soft toothbrushes will be provided to the patients and they will receive a new toothbrush every seven days starting 48 hours after chemotherapy is complete. No flossing, toothpicks, or water picks are allowed. If a patient is on a blood thinner medication, this medication will be stopped when the platelet counts drop below 50. We ask that patients avoid blowing their nose forcefully and to use electric razors only. It is also important for patients to trim their fingernails and toenails prior to admission and do not bring clippers to the hospital. If needed, a file or emery board will be provided. On the admission day to the inpatient unit, patients will enter at Red Valet. Once entered, the admissions office is to the right, and this is where admission paperwork will be completed. Once completed, the patient will be provided their room number and directions on where to proceed. Each BMT patient will be admitted to either 3 West or 4 West inpatient unit. Each unit is laid out exactly the same. All rooms are private and have a television and internet access. Patients are required to stay on the unit and not walk past the double doors unless for a procedure or test. Patients, their family and friends are also not allowed to go into another patient's room for any reason. Visiting hours are open, but anyone entering the unit must be 12 years of age or older. 
One adult caregiver may stay overnight at any time or even the whole time the patient is admitted. There is a pull-out bed and linens are available. Visitors are not allowed to use the patient's toilet, but may use the shower and sink. There are also two separate restrooms on each floor and a family lounge with a restroom and shower at the front of each unit for visitor use. Most importantly, no sick visitors are allowed. We want our patients to be as comfortable as possible during this stay. It is not required to wear a hospital gown during the inpatient stay. However, they are available if needed. Patients can wear whatever they are most comfortable in. It may be easier to wear tops with buttons to allow for easier access to the central line, but this is not mandatory. Feet must be covered at all times when out of bed. We recommend shoes with good traction and do not recommend flip-flops. Slipper socks can also be provided. If patients experience hair loss, it is often good to bring hats, scarves, wigs, or other. Patients can bring their own personal care supplies. However, these can also be provided. Patients' own pillow, blanket, or comforter can also be brought in for comfort. Just make sure they have been cleaned and are, are new upon admission. Pictures are welcomed, just no glass frames, please. And if hearing aids or eyeglasses are used by the patient, make sure they are also brought in. Patients may also want to consider bringing small crafts, hobbies, cards, board games, a laptop, or books for things to do. Other items that may be helpful during this time are the patient and caregiver transplant guide provided by Moffitt Cancer Center, a copy of any advanced directives, such as a living will or healthcare surrogate designation, diabetic supplies, which may be needed at discharge if the patients do not live close, and any other personal medical equipment that may be needed upon discharge while staying locally. Since patients are not allowed to leave the inpatient unit, once admitted, caregivers would need to do laundry if necessary. There is a washer and dryer located on the fifth floor for patient and caregiver use. Patients are encouraged to bring many changes of clothes for their hospital stay. However, as mentioned, hospital gowns are available. During the inpatient stay and at discharge, it is important that patients practice food safety to decrease infection risk. Patients should not eat sushi, raw meat, or raw fish during this time. Patients can order anything from the hospital menu. The hospital food service staff knows how to prepare their food. Food can be brought in from home by family or caregivers, and there are refrigerators on each unit. However, a patient label and date is required and is available on the unit. Refrigerated food can only be stored for two days in the pantry. And once the food container has been brought into the patient room, it cannot be brought back to the refrigerator. Food from restaurants is allowed if it is picked up by a family member or caregiver and brought directly to the hospital. No delivery is allowed. During the patient's inpatient stay, the blood and marrow transplant team is working hard every day to plan the patient's care and address needs and concerns. There are numerous members on the inpatient BMT team and patients will meet all of the team members soon after admission. Daily BMT rounds are done as a team daily to ensure all services collaborate on the plan of care for the patient. This team consists of a BMT physician, which rotates or changes every two weeks, a possible fellow, an advanced practice provider, such as a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, a registered nurse, social worker, dietitian, case manager, pharmacist, and physical therapist. Along with BMT daily rounds, the following is a generalized daily routine while the patient is in the inpatient unit. Nursing staff will draw blood every morning and weigh the patient. 
Weekly rectal swabs will be performed to test for potential bacteria. And nursing assessments and vital signs are completed every four hours. Staff may need to take additional vital signs such as orthostatic vital signs. Staff will also check in on the patient hourly and measure any intake or output. As part of the day, physical therapy may visit and work with the patient. We want our patients to stay as active as possible by walking in the halls, sitting up in their chairs and staying out of bed. Medications, IV fluids and transfusions will be administered as ordered or as needed. And patients will need to perform personal hygiene. The three main things for our patients to focus on each day during this treatment is to eat, drink, and walk. These three things may be simple, but are the keys to success during transplant and should be a daily focus. As mentioned, personal hygiene is an important part of the daily routine. Patients will be provided CHG, or what is called HIPAA cleanse, when they are admitted. CHG is a medication for the skin that helps prevent infection. Either the CHG soap provided or the wipes must be used daily, unless of course a patient has a reaction or is sensitive to the product. CHG soap is applied directly to the skin and rinsed in the shower. CHG wipes on the other hand can be used in place of showering and do not require rinsing. CHG should not be used on the face. Another form of personal hygiene and an important part of infection prevention is mouth care. The mouth contains many kinds of bacteria, so performing mouth care such as brushing your teeth, cleaning dentures and partials, and using oral rinses will help keep the mouth clean and moist. Patients will be provided soft toothbrushes, alcohol-free mouth wash and rinse, toothpaste, and petroleum-free lip and mouth moisturizer. Patients should brush four times a day, after meals and at bedtime, and after vomiting. If patients are experiencing vomiting or mouth sores or are currently not able to take anything by mouth, this schedule may need to change or increase. The nurse will help the patient determine what is best. As mentioned, during the daily routines, patients will have their vital signs taken every four hours. However, there may be times that additional vital signs called orthostatic vital signs may be needed to help determine if the patient is experiencing orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension occurs when there is a significant drop in blood pressure and an increase in pulse with position changes. Staff will assess this by taking the patient's blood pressure while they are lying down, sitting, and standing and compare the results. If a patient is found to have orthostatic hypotension, they are at great risk of getting dizzy, passing out, or falling. Patients should always report to the nurse if they are feeling dizzy or lightheaded. If the patient is found to have orthostatic hypotension, staff will encourage the patient to drink more fluids. The patient may also need to receive IV fluids and the medical team will evaluate the medication the patient is taking to see if this could be increasing this risk. Fall precautions will also be put into place if orthostatic hypotension is determined. Orthostatic hypotension is only one of several reasons patients could be at risk of falling when they are in the hospital. Falls can occur in any age group, at any time, and any place. Falls can also be caused by side effects of treatment, medication, weakness, fatigue, dehydration, and or decreased blood counts. If the patient is at high risk, we will take extra measures to prevent the patient from falling. When fall precautions are put into place, a bed and or chair alarm will be turned on. Patients will be asked to get out of bed or the chair only with staff present. Staff will stay by the patient's side in the bathroom where most falls commonly occur for patient safety. 
Although these precautions may be put into place, this should not stop the patient from walking in the hall and getting out of bed with staff assistance. It is important patients partner with the medical staff to keep them safe by calling for assistance, wearing closed-toed shoes, wearing hearing aids and glasses if needed, using recommended assistive devices such as walkers, and by storing personal items within reach. Once the patient has been approved for discharge, caregivers may be expected to flush all three lumens of the patient's central line on the days the patient does not have to come to the clinic or treatment center for an appointment. During the patient's stay in the hospital, or even when discharged, nurses are available to demonstrate and teach how to flush a central line and allow time for the caregiver to practice. Step-by-step -step written instructions will be also provided at discharge in the folder provided to the patient. Central line flushing should be demonstrated back to a nurse by the caregiver prior to them doing it on their own. Once the patient has engrafted, and the absolute neutrophil count is greater than 500, they may be able to be discharged from the hospital to local lodging. To be discharged from the hospital, the patient must have not had a fever in the last 24 hours. They need to be able to eat and drink, swallow oral medications, and any IV medications or fluids that are needed need to be able to be managed in our outpatient treatment center. Patients are required to have a caregiver with them when they are discharged from the hospital, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Both patients and caregivers must have attended the BMT discharge education class and housing arrangements for local lodging must be in place. The BMT discharge education class is provided virtually over Zoom every Wednesday and Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Once the patient is discharged, please expect frequent visits to the BMT clinic and treatment center. This is where the patient's primary BMT doctor and medical staff will continue to monitor them until day plus 90 or when they feel it is okay for the patients to go home. During this time, readmission to the hospital may be necessary if the medical team wants to monitor the patient more closely. Prior to returning home, the central line will be removed. Graft versus host disease. Graft versus host disease, or is what it often referred to as GVHD for short, is a common complication following an allogeneic stem cell transplant. It occurs when the new donor T cells begin to grow and see the patient's body as foreign or unfamiliar and attack those cells. It often happens in the first year following transplant and can be mild, moderate, or severe. There are two types of graft-versus-host disease, and those are acute and chronic. Acute and chronic GVHD differ in signs and symptoms and the time of onset. Acute GVHD usually occurs within the first 100 days after transplant. Symptoms can begin as early as day 15 and generally affect the skin, GI tract, and the liver. Chronic graft-versus-host disease usually occurs 100 days after transplant. It can develop as early as three months and can affect the skin, liver, eyes, mouth, lungs, GI tract, and others. A patient may develop one type, both type, or neither type. It is important patients pay attention to changes in their body after transplant and inform the medical team about these changes. To reduce the risk of developing GVHD, the medical team starts by finding the patient a matched donor. Usually, the closer the match, the lower the risk. However, even with a perfect match, there is still a risk of graft-versus-host disease. Patients are also given medication called immunosuppressant starting a day or two after the stem cell transplant. These medications weaken the donor's immune system, making it more difficult for the donor's cells to attack. 
after the first line of treatment is steroids. However, the drugs, treatments, and even clinical trials are available. The patient's doctor and medical team will determine what is the best fit to help manage the GVH day on an individual patient basis. Blood and Marrow Transplant Survivorship Program. An allogeneic stem cell transplant is a journey. And after transplant, the BMT Survivorship Program at Moffitt Cancer Center is here to help. This program is for all allogeneic transplant patients who are at least 90 days out from transplant, but still within the first year of their transplant. There are two locations with specific days they are available. Wednesday afternoon at the Magnolia campus or the main campus in the BMT clinic, and at Moffitt and Wesley Chapel within Advent Health on the second floor both Mondays and Thursdays. The long-term goal of Survivorship Clinic is to prolong your life after transplant. Their survivorship appointment is a one-on-one -on -one appointment with a BMT advanced practice provider. The advanced practice provider works with patients to recommend necessary specialties that are needed while still utilizing the BMT team as a resource for guiding care. They help create a comprehensive survivorship care plan specific to each patient to help improve the patient's self-efficiency over time and when it comes to asking the right questions about their care. This is not a support group or class for urgent needs or issues. Please do not attend a survivorship appointment if you are sick. You would need to be evaluated by your primary BMT team. Thank you for watching our video today on allogeneic stem cell transplant at Moffitt Cancer Center. This video is not a substitute for required scheduled classes for patients and or caregivers. The content is not intended to be medical advice and the viewers should consult their physician should they have any questions. Viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation for immediate or urgent medical needs. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department, or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of information contained in this presentation.